Today on Applied Science, we're going to talk about the Zeeman effect. This is another one of these cool electromagnetic effects that reminds us that uh, electromagnetism basically controls everything in the universe, and it takes a cool little demo like this to get a visual representation of it. So this is kind of similar to a video I did on the Faraday effect recently. So let's take a look at the setup here. We've got a low pressure sodium lamp in the box here with a diffuser just to give us a nice orange light source. And then we've got an oxyacetylene torch making a nice stable flame here. And then we've got an electromagnet, and this magnet has holes going transverse through and vertically through so that I can position this over the flame like this so that the flame is going up through the magnet, but we can still see the light through the holes in the side there. So let me move this out of the way so we can see something else for a sec. You've probably seen the trick where you uh, dissolve some sodium nitrate or even sodium chloride in water and then just use a little bit of shoelace or wick to, to introduce sodium into the flame like this. And this works just fine. But for today's demo, I'm going to use a little ceramic rod that's been heated up very hot and then dipped in salt. And the reason that I do this is that the flame that comes out is way more stable. So there's no spattering because there's no water involved. Okay, now with the magnet in place, uh, the sodium in the flame, if you look down the barrel and turn the magnet on and off, this is what you see. Pretty cool, right? The first thing that's weird is that the flame is actually obstructing the light that's coming out from the sodium lamp. And then you can see when I turn the magnet on and off, the flame becomes opaque or less opaque depending whether the field is on or not. In a similar setup, we can use a little projection lens here to make an image of the flame that's inside the magnet and project it onto the paper there. And so same deal, if you look at the image of the flame on the paper, and then I turn the magnet on and off, you can see the flame is suddenly dark and bright. What's happening is it's obscuring the light from the lamp or not obscuring it as much, hence getting lighter and darker. It's so cool. I really love these effects where you can use magnetism to control light directly. Like there's no device in here. It's literally just the atoms responding directly to the magnetic field. So let's parse what's going on in here. If we've got this low pressure sodium light giving off light, you can see that when the flame is neutral or it doesn't have any um, ions in it especially, it's clear. So we can see the light from the sodium lamp, no problem. But if we introduce sodium ions into the flame, something weird happens the flame actually blocks the light from the sodium lamp. And if you think about it in sort of a hand wavy sense, this kind of makes sense. It's sort of like we've got sodium ions giving off light in the light source. Then if we put more sodium ions in front of it, it's kind of the same thing. And so it's blocking the same wavelength of light. You can see that there's a balance here too. So the hot part of the flame is giving off more light than is coming from the lamp behind it but up near the top of the flame, there's sort of just the right balance of sodium ions to absorb the light and make it look darker than the light source that's coming from behind it. So to do this experiment, you sort of have to fine tune where we are in the flame so that we get this kind of opaque effect. Another interesting way to see this is to start with a white light source, and I'll put a slit in front of it, and then look at that white light source with a um, diffraction grating so that we can see the whole rainbow. Then if we introduce sodium ions into the flame of an alcohol lamp, you can actually see that the sodium ions absorb that orange light, and it's a very narrow, specific band. If we zoom in here, you can see just a little sliver of the spectrum missing when I introduce the sodium ions, so they're clearly absorbing that one color. Now the Zeeman effect says that we can shift the exact point that the sodium ions absorb or emit light by putting it into a really strong magnetic field. And so the trick here is that if we have this flame opaquing effect going on, where we can't see the light from the light source through the flame because they're at exactly the same spectral range, they're right on top of each other in terms of spectral lines. But if we put the flame in a magnetic field, then its exact line won't line up with the line from the light source because this magnetic field has actually shifted the line's position a little bit. And that's exactly what's happening here. So we, we turn on the magnetic field, the flame's orange becomes a very slightly different shade of orange than the light coming from the light source behind it, and this opaquing effect goes away because the lines don't line up anymore. I originally saw this demo from another YouTube channel called XO Funk OX, and you should definitely go check out their channel. They've got a lot of really cool physics demos. I thought this was really creative because normally to see the um, Zeeman effect 
all, all they do is sort of turn on the magnetic field and through looking through a spectroscope, you can see the line divide into two lines because of this magnetic field. And that's cool and everything, but I really like this flame opaqueing effect because it, it's a very elegant way to show it in a very, you know, kind of hands-on way. So here's the hand wavy explanation for why this effect occurs. Uh, think about what gives sodium its characteristic color. When you excite the atoms, either with high voltage or a flame, they move up into a higher energy state, and then when they fall back down to the ground state, they emit this characteristic color. And so for sodium ions, it's this orange color dominated by the two spectral lines there. And for something like neon, it's a red color. Okay, cool. Um, in a really strong magnetic field, it will alter the, the state, this elevated state that the atom can go into. And the reason is that uh, electron shells are basically moving charge, and moving charge is basically a magnetic field. So if you put the atom into a strong magnetic field and excite it, it will actually go up to an either higher or a lower energy state, depending whether it agrees with the polarity of the field or not. So the Zeeman effect basically splits one spectral line into two or more. And the reason it can be even more is because there's multiple electron shells in the atom, and the Zeeman effect will affect all of them in different ways. It gets pretty complicated, and if you go to the Wikipedia page, it's really heavy on the physics and the equations, and it doesn't really help give a um, qualitative sense or understanding of what this is. This effect actually crops up in lots of different places, though. For example, MRI machines rely on this for their basic function. So when you go into an MRI machine, you're going into a really high magnetic field, and uh, all the atoms in your body now have these additional energy states. And so when the machine excites them, uh, the whole reason the system works is because it gives them these different places to go uh, through the Zeeman effect. Another really cool application of this is for astronomers. So if you look at the light from a star, or even our own star, the sun, um, if there's a strong magnetic field there, we can tell that it's exactly what the magnitude of the field is based on how far the lines have shifted due to the Zeeman effect. So we can do experiments on the ground, and we know that, you know, for example, helium emits at exactly a certain frequency. But we know that if helium is in a certain magnetic field, the lines will actually be split. And then if we measure the split, we can tell the magnetic field. And that's how we know that sunspots actually have really strong magnetic fields. Let's take a look at some of the practical details for doing this experiment. The light is an 18 watt low pressure sodium lamp that I got off Amazon, <laughs> even shipped next day, I love this. The only problem is finding a ballast for it is not so easy. So people have come up with sort of clued solutions and here's one of them. I basically cracked open the base of a cheap uh, compact fluorescent lamp and took out the circuit board and it's here. And uh, the trick is that a compact fluorescent lamp has filaments in either side, so it's like a four terminal device. But the low pressure sodium lamp only has two terminals. So I just put resistors on the circuit board to mimic the resistance of these filaments and that caused it to start working. And it's, it's running just about properly. It's an 18 watt light. Uh, in my setup, it's only drawing about 13 or 14 watts. And so it's slightly underdriven, but the warm up sequence is pretty cool. These low pressure sodium lamps contain a mix of neon and argon, and that's actually the color that you see when you first turn them on. And then over the course of, you know, 10 minutes or so, the sodium vaporizes and starts giving off the majority of the light. The electromagnet is made from two microwave oven transformers that I cut open and then removed the high voltage coil and also cut the middle pole piece to try to get some flux concentration. Um, we want the field to be really strong and concentrated into a small area. So it works out to cut the pole pieces like this. And then I added a little bit of uh, extra material here so that we had a gap so that we could look through the magnet uh, horizontally and vertically. The magnetic field has to be pretty strong to see this effect. We're talking about one tesla of magnetic field. And so I, this is not the first electromagnet that I built. Uh, the first one I thought looked really great, uh, but I tried making it work for days actually and never got the effect out of it. And so I resorted to buying this uh, uh, magnetic field meter. And this has actually proven quite handy. So here's the startup sequence. My power supply is actually a welding power supply that I added some instrumentation to. And it won't start up when, it's, when it has this much of a load on it. So I turn it on first with the throttle down all the way and then connect it up. 
and it's drawing about, oh, I don't know, five amps or something idling. And I'm going to put the magnetic field gauge into the gap and we're getting about half a Tesla. Pretty good. So I'm gonna crank it up and at maximum power, it's doing about one Tesla or 1.1, 1.2 Tesla. And this thing can only run in at full power for bursts of, you know, 10 or 20 seconds. I, if I, I'll turn this off first. If I put my hand on here, it's, it's already warm. And uh, the other downside is this thing is kind of in the flame. And so everything is heating it up. And it's not really a long-term experiment, of course. Initially, I also tried doing this experiment with permanent magnets. And so I have these really thick, like half-inch thick neodymium magnets. And after I got the flux meter here, I measured them and was very surprised, actually quite impressed that it's doing about 0.8 of a Tesla. Um, this should be enough to see the effect. The only problem is that you mechanically have to move the magnets in and out of the flame path. And just the fact that you're putting this cold metal next to the flame uh, changes how the ions are emitting light. So you can kind of convince yourself the effect is there, but really, if you just take cold pieces of metal spaced about like this, and you move them in and out of the flame, you can kind of see it changing the characteristic. And so it's, it's too tough to really see the effect. I also learned quite a lot about engineering electromagnets. Um, I even did some equations and stuff to figure out what was going to work the best, uh, how to optimize the most magnetic field for kind of the least amount of copper and the least amount of energy. And um, I've been wanting to do a video on magnetics for a long time, like how to choose toroid material and what's the difference between ferrite and iron powder and you know, electrical steel versus iron and all these things. And so that's going to be the topic of next video. And I uh, will see you then. See you next time. Bye.